we started a series last week on the scarlet thread of redemption. There is a scarlet thread that goes all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, Old Testament and New, and all of it is about Jesus. And it is about, it's a love story. It's about how God has given himself wholly to man. And God is for you today. You know, we are living, as 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, uh, you know, actually put that up on the screen. Man, the Lord's just been, I, can, I can't tell you in words how the Lord's been dealing with me about just our church where we are uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, my job as a, as a pastor, what, what's burning in my heart, you know, I never preach what I want. I never do what I want. I have no desire to do that uh, because he's so good. He knows what we need. But it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days, now that's a little vague because the last days started when Jesus came out of the tomb almost 2,000 years ago, just under 2,000 years ago. This phrase in the Greek is different. You, it would, you would translate this, know this, this know also in the final days. Perilous times will come. And this word perilous, the, the word itself literally means dangerous and difficult, strength-reducing days will come. Satan is working behind the scenes as a deceiver. He operates as an outlaw. But he's, he, he is working behind the scenes to zap the strength of believers. Dangerous and difficult times, it, it doesn't say they might come, it says they shall come. And this is why they come. For men, that's male and female, will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be covetous, they'll be boasters. I mean, people boast about, hey, look at me, I'm at this restaurant, they're self-centered, let me take a selfie about this and this is what I'm doing today. It's all about me. And, and you know, some of that's fun, but be careful with that. Amen. Because, man, you, the last thing you want to do is get your eyes too much on you, right? It says they'll be boasters and, and they'll be proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Have you noticed that the whole society portrays parents as idiots? There's a reason for that, Right? Don't put your kids in an environment where predominantly all they're hearing is something that's going to turn them into being disobedient to you, right? Look at this, unthankful, unholy, right? Unholy denotes behavior. And it starts, you start to read this and you're going, yeah, this is in the world. But as you keep reading, you start to realize, whoa, wait a minute, this is not just talking about people who don't know God right? It goes without natural affection. Without natural affection. Wow. I mean, that's people who are hard-hearted towards others. The, the personality, there's, there's, there's about 24 or 25 personality disorders naturally that they've come up with. And, and narcissism, I, I, I can't even imagine how that's growing. Just a hard-heartedness towards others, Right? It's because of the day we're living in. It says here, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitor, traitors, heady, high-minded. Look at this, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now we're starting to get into talking about Christians, aren't we? Because the world... They might not even believe in God, so you wouldn't say they love pleasure more than God. They just love pleasure because they, do, they don't really acknowledge God, right? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power therein. So in other words, we have a church building. We have a bulletin. We've got, we come to church, and we have services. Oh, but that Holy Spirit guy, you know, we put him in the back room. He's not allowed to come here and move in his gifts and things. 
that's odd. Because today, what you felt in worship, guess what? Was as you were worshiping the Lord, he was revealing things. And he was moving in our midst. Today, he's the teacher, right? I don't know exactly what you need. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm like, man, I, like right now, I have 20 pages of notes. Is that ridiculous? It's ridiculous. But I might not, I'll say a whole bunch of stuff that's not in the notes. Why is that? Because the Lord moves towards hunger. If you're hungry today, if you're knocking, if you're asking, if you're seeking with all your heart, if you have ears to hear, man, he's going to make sure you hear something. It says, from such turn away. Wow. It goes down. It says in verse 7 that in these days people will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in other words, they learn what the Bible says, but they never come to know it. And remember, Bible knowing is not intellectual or mental. It's to experience. It's to gain revelation knowledge. God doesn't want you to know, just know about him. He wants you to experience him. He wants to come into your life, meet you right where you are, and he is not moved where you are. Right? Because nothing, there's no mess that he doesn't feel comfortable in. He is the master at fixing messes and making all things new. Amen. Right? So, so the world gets portrayed that God is this religious, sitting on a throne, old guy. You know, God's not old. Right? He lives outside of time. How could he be old? Right? If you were to look at him, he doesn't look like an old man. You know, wrinkles and just kind of not happy. No, if, you, if, if God were to manifest himself, he's love. He is joy. He's full of mercy. You would instantly just be like, oh my gosh, this guy is amazing. This God is amazing, right? So it goes on, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Inter in interesting times we live in. The Bible says right before Jesus will come back, there will be an apostasy, a falling away. And we're seeing that as never before. It's amazing the people that have been really on fire for the Lord that today are just not in church. They never read their Bible. They have that God is not a part of their life. It's, it's almost like they're blind. And, and we're living in those times. And what's interesting about those times, while we have this falling away, we also have this other thing going on where people are running to the Lord. There's also, I mean, gosh, I've heard stories overseas. Two weeks you have, I mean, literally in two weeks you have two million people giving their heart to Christ. And I can't remember the country. Joe was telling us about it. I, I, what's going on in Egypt and Nigeria and in the Middle East? And I mean, there's a minister in the Middle East that this guy is surrounded by terrorist groups that want to kill him. And they'll go into a Muslim village to preach the gospel to, to a village that has never heard the gospel from anybody. Nobody's ever went there. And they'll go in and they're kind of like, okay, we're coming in here because we're led. Because you, you have to be led in that ministry or you die. Right? I mean, usually you'll die quick. They'll cut your head off, but whatever. You know, there's some parts of the world where when, when a person gets saved in the Middle East that they know they have about six months to live and their goal is to disciple one person, get one person saved and disciple them before they're taken out. Isn't that crazy? So they'll go into a village, and all of a sudden they'll start talking about Jesus, and the villagers will go, oh yeah, we're, we're all Christians. And they're like, what? The whole village. And they're like, yeah, Jesus appeared to us, and we accepted him, and we've been praying that he would send somebody to teach us. Isn't that amazing? That, that's all going on while in our circles we're like, yeah, you know, I don't really ever read my Bible, and, but, I, but I, you know, I'm a Christian because I believe in God. Why do we have such of that? This is why I'm preaching on the blood covenant. 
Because the blood covenant will answer the question. It, it, it's all through the Bible, over and over and over and over again. God is saying, you can trust me because everything that I am, everything that I have, everything that I can do is at your disposal. I'm in covenant with you. And that covenant will never be broken because the guarantor of that covenant is not you and I, it's Jesus. And we're going to learn about that. When you see, we're going to spend a lot of time on the Abraham, the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, because the Bible talks a lot about it. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Anyway, I have so many things to go into today, but I want to encourage you. As a pastor, I want to encourage you that this is not the time to say no to God. Nobody can tell you except yourself where you are. And everybody sitting here, you know where you are. You might not know exactly everything where you are, but you know if there's an area of your life that you need to make an adjustment, do it. Because guys, I, don't, I, know, I know that the rapture of the church is very close. I don't know what we'll go through before that. I can't, I can't sit here and tell you. You know, I think there's a good chance we could be on the brink of something that none of us have ever lived through, a world war, right? And, and we, don't, we just don't know, but there are some things that we know, that God is our protector, that he is our provider, that he is our strength, and that the righteous are as bold as a lion because, because boldness comes from knowing him. So here's the deal today. God knows you. And you know what? He's got a smile on his face. Oh, he might not be pleased with some of your behavior right now, but he's got a smile on his face because he knows if you'll yield to him, he will walk you. He'll turn your life right, up, right, right side up. He doesn't turn your life upside down. He'll turn it right side up. He'll clean out all the junk. He will provide for you beyond your wildest dreams. He'll heal your body. He'll do all of these things. Restore your life because that's just who he is. So the blood covenant is the scarlet thread of redemption. We said this last week. I'm going to say it again. The Old Testament is a picture of the salvation message of Jesus. The Old Testament is God pointing to Jesus who would show up in the future and telling about him so that when he showed up, everyone would know it was him. The whole Old Testament, that's what, that's what the Old Testament is for. The Old Testament tells us what is going to happen. The New Testament tells us how it happened, tells us all about it. And when you go into the Gospels, it's like you're looking at a photograph. You see Christ. You see exactly the way he walked on this earth, which is exactly the way you're to walk on this earth. Then you get to the epistles, right? You, you get beyond Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, and then you go all the way up to the book of Revelation. You look at the epistles, and now it's like you're seeing an x-ray or an MRI. You're seeing into Christ, and you see yourself, how you fit in this whole thing. So the key to understanding the Word of God, this is a major key. If you don't figure this out, you won't understand the Word, and you'll live blind. The key to understanding the Scriptures, the way the Old and New Testament is linked together as the same story. It's all one story. If I'm ever preaching something and it doesn't fit Genesis all the way through Revelation, it's not rightly dividing the word, okay? And, and if you'll notice when we preach things, this is why I tell people, listen, when you're discipling somebody, don't have them start in the book of Genesis. They'll die in Leviticus, right? Because they don't understand New Testament truth but when you understand New Testament truth, then you read the Old Testament in the light of it and you see Jesus everywhere. And we're going to open that up to you. Now, the word covenant, remember, it means 
to cut until blood flows. When a covenant was cut, blood would flow, right? And for you guys, we went over, and I actually, there's a couple great books. Um, E.W. Kenyon has this little book. Uh, this is brilliant. It's so little. It's on the blood covenant. For a man to write a book this size on the blood covenant, his depth of understanding has to be unreal. And it is. So there's a lot of neat things if you want to get that book. And you, you could, I don't even know if we have it. We probably don't have it in the bookstore yet. Uh, I think I'll get in trouble for this, but you know, they'll probably have it in the future, but you could probably get it on Amazon or wherever. And then I've quoted this one. I read you guys the nine steps in a Hebrew covenant. Uh, and it, it just, it'll help you understand the word of God. The, the miracle of the scarlet thread. And it's by Booker, Richard Booker. This is, I love this book. They, I think that, I don't know if it still is, but they have used this even at Rhema in the class on the blood covenant because he just says something so simple. I, I like simple, right? I've got some other books on the blood covenant that there's a lot of good stuff in it, but man, you got to sort through a lot of stuff and you got to take energy drinks to get through it because it'll just put you to sleep big time, right? So the premise of what we're talking about is Leviticus 17, 11. The first part of that verse reveals something that is so powerful. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay? The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why God, after, after the flood, when he said animals, you could eat animals as food, he said, listen, don't drink the blood. That was forbidden. Because that is the life force and, and, and if you look at Satanism and a lot of demonic things, they, they're into drinking blood, right? Well, of course they are because it's opposite of God. The flesh, no, but the blood, you, you could eat the flesh, but just don't drink the blood, right? So Leviticus 17.11, it's really amazing how that they're finding out things. If you, if you look at rehab, and, and, and you're going to rehab an injury or anything, the key is get blood flow in there because it'll bring life to things. So the sacredness of blood in relationship to strong commitments have been practiced ever since Adam, ever since the Garden of Eden. This has gone all the way through scriptures because all of it points to Jesus. So this book, The Miracle of the Scarlet Thread, there's a couple statements that'll be perfect to review what we went into last week. And if you, if you weren't here, go there and listen, listen to that message and, and outline it. Because, man, I'll tell you, it'll, build, it'll help you build trust in the Lord. So many Christians are stuck. They're stuck in things because they know God's a healer, but they don't know him as their healer. They know God's a provider, but they may not know him as their provider. They know God delivers and restores and makes things new, but they just don't know that that would be there for them. And I'm here to tell you the blood covenant will answer that question. It'll completely answer that question. But in the book, The Miracle of the Scarlet Thread, he makes a statement. He says, a blood covenant between two parties is the closest the most enduring, the most solemn, and the most sacred of all contracts, it absolutely cannot be broken. Okay? Your covenant with God can't be broken. There's, there's blood on a mercy seat that is speaking right now in heaven. It's Jesus' blood, and it is saying, you are forever mine. It was his behavior that we base our salvation and everything on, not our behavior, right? In the book, it also says this, another quote, when you enter into blood covenant with someone, you promise to give them your life, this is what God did for us, your love and your protection forever. God has given us his life his love, and his protection, right? All you parents of little kids, 
you can stand in your authority and know that the angel of the Lord is with, with your child and that that child will never be abducted, abused, right? It, now, it doesn't happen automatically, but if you know your authority, you know God has commissioned angels to protect you, your family, your children, right? And, and we need to know that in this day. It says here, everything you have is theirs, and everything they have is yours. So think about it in context of God. <laughs> it's not really much to give him your all. Because think about this. God has given you his whole life. All that he is, is yours. He's given you all of his love. Do you realize his love... I mean, it never fails. Nothing can separate you from his love. He's given you all of his protection. Now, we have a story in the Old Testament where one angel with one sword killed 186,000 men in one night. If you break that down, he's killing several people per second. I mean... And the Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him. Fear him. Are afraid of him? No, no, no. The word fear means to reverence, to honor, and to respect him above everything else. In other words, you're safe. He loves you. I love that. So, when we talk about the blood covenant... Let's talk real quickly about this great exchange. What does the Bible say? This is what God gave to man. Number one, Jesus became the son of man, right? So that you and I might become a son of God. Jesus paid our price. Jesus is not a way He's the way. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that powerful? Right? I mean, didn't Buddha say at the end of his life, he's like, hey, I, I don't really, I'm not really sure if I know what truth really is. Right? Muhammad is like, well, I think I'm pointing to the truth. Wow, was that guy messed up? But Jesus didn't say anything like that. He said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, right? We have a sure foundation. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says this, but as many as received him, th this Greek word received means to accept fully. To them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, right? Number two, Jesus became sin so that I may come to be the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was made to bear all of our sin and our sin nature so that we could come to be the very righteousness of Almighty God. And I got to tell you guys, when you know you're righteous and all that that means, in righteousness, you'll be fixed and immovable. You will be far from oppression because it won't come near you, right? You won't fear anything from terror. It'll be far from you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I'm quoting Isaiah 54, right? Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you can condemn the tongue while still loving the person. 2 Corinthians 5.21 brings this fact out. For he, God the Father, made him Jesus. It, this word made literally means made Jesus bear. Made him to be sin. And in this word sin is hamartia. It's an innocent sin sacrifice. Jesus as an innocent sin sacrifice, God the Father made him bear all of our sin. All of it. All of our spiritual death, everything. For us who knew no sin, why? 
that we might be made a different Greek word. It means come to be the righteousness of God in him. Wow. Here's the third one. Jesus became a curse so that I, so that you may enjoy the blessing. Right? Galatians chapter 3 in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law, if you go back to Deuteronomy 28 when it outlines it, the curse, think of it this way, and you study through the Old Testament, it's threefold. We've been redeemed from spiritual death. We've been redeemed from sickness, disease, and pain. And we've been redeemed from poverty and lack. Jesus literally bore our sickness. He bore our poverty. He bore our lack. So He bore our spiritual death so that we could be made the righteousness of God, so that we can walk in divine health, so that we can receive healing, right? Because we have unrenewed bodies. They're subject to sickness and disease. We live in a world, the whole world system is designed to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know there's people in the world that are manipulating the world and they're making billions and billions and billions of dollars and what they don't realize is their whole life is a vapor and they are running at a million miles an hour off a cliff to eternal loss, right? There are no billionaires in hell. There's, there, there, there's hopelessness. There's, they're completely, they live a little vapor here and then they're lost forever. Everything in the world system, all roads with Satan lead to death. The cool thing, though, is we live in the kingdom of God in the world system, so now we can believe God, and through sowing and reaping, through believing God, we could lay hold of all the funds, all the finances, everything that we could ever need to do all that God's called us to do, to live at a level where people look at you and go, wow, Jesus is doing this. He's a good father, right? We could pull it right out, and Satan can't stop it. Genesis chapter 8 says he can't stop seed time and harvest. If you sow, you'll reap. Now, you might be sitting here going, well, I just, I want to believe this stuff. But you'll know if you believe it, because you'll be speaking it, right? You'll be able to look at your finances and tell where your treasure is. You'll be able to look at your behavior, right? When a pain hits your body, what, is, what comes out of your mouth? I reject that. Satan, you, you take your hands off me. You have no legal right. Jesus bore this, so I refuse to bear it, right? You don't deny a symptom, you deny its right to remain in your body because of this. Because Jesus was made a curse so that I may enjoy his blessing. Christ has redeemed me and you from the curse of the law because he was made a curse for us. Because it is written, Deuteronomy, he's quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. Right? And why did he do that? So that the blessing of Abraham would come upon us. Here's another one that kind of fits the same way. Jesus became sick so that I may be healed. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, it says, Surely he, talking about Jesus, hath, past tense, borne. He born something. What did he born? My griefs. Well, that's kind of weird. Because it's the Greek word or the Hebrew word koli. It is never translated griefs. Now, is that a false translation? Well, the translator used it because it's part of the word koli. So the word koli, every other time, is talking about physical sickness and disease. The word koli is talking about physical sickness and disease and the grief that comes along with it. So they specified the grief part, but that's the grief just comes, have you ever been 
Have you ever had some stuff going on in your body? Your body's not working right. There, there's grief to that. But surely Jesus hath something happened in the past when about A.D. 30 through maybe A.D. 32, 33, right in that area, almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus actually bore our, all of our physical sicknesses and diseases. Right? And it says, and he carried. This, this word carry is the Hebrew word sabal. It literally means to carry something as a penalty. He carried what? Our sorrows. So this, it's, the Greek, or it's the Hebrew word makab, sorrows. It literally means every other time in the Old Testament, it's translated physical pain. And the sorrow that physical pain brings. But the King James translators, they couldn't say sickness and pain because they would be saying, oh my gosh, do you mean God has provided healing for everybody? Oh, we can't say that. So they just kind of twisted that little Hebrew word a little bit. But we know. Now we have all these tools. I don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to know. Surely Jesus, he bore my physical sickness and disease, and he carried away my pain. And then it goes on to say, yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted. Who did that? The Bible says that God made Jesus sick. Now, how did he do that? God has no sickness, so how could he make Jesus sick? He literally picked up all of the sickness, all the disease, all the poverty, all the lack, all the curse of the law, and he smote Jesus with it. And it said that it, took, it, was, it brought him pleasure to do that. You think God doesn't love you? Man, I mean, Isaiah said to look upon his visage, that means his physical form, you could not tell he was human. The weight and judgment of all the sickness, all the disease, all the spiritual death, all the poverty, all the lack, all the demonic source of that did things to his physical body that are, I mean, that Roman centurion literally who was the master at crucifixion, had never seen anything like this. And he said, surely, surely this guy is who he said he is. Surely he is the son of God, right? It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, this is interesting, the chastisement the discipline. Have you ever been disciplined by your parents? As a little kid, my mom would light certain part, a certain part of my body that has a lot of padding. She would light that up with a wooden spoon. When, when I still look at wooden spoons today, I'm like, you see a cooking utensil, <laughs> right? My mom, actually, my mom actually put it on the wall, and I, I can't remember what she, she wrote on it, something about this is for the purpose of correcting Tony. <laughs> and man, right? I was so grateful when I, I'm then, then I, then we moved out of Chicago and, and my mom married my stepdad who grew up in the country. And so the country, they don't use wooden spoons. <laughs> they use switches. What is a switch? And then, then, then we, they were renting a house that had these plants. And, and this, I mean, it was about this big around from the ground up, like six feet long. And, and man, my dad would go, okay, go out and cut a switch. So I'd come in <laughs> with a switch. And he looked at me and he goes, he goes, the longer it takes you to find the one I'm going to use, the longer I'm going to use it. So then you bring in this thing going, okay, so you bring in this big thing, right? And then after that first switching with that, uh, you learn, man, whittle those little knobs off because the knobs are not fun, right? But then I graduated and I realized something. 
I would pray that it was my stepdad. They'd send me up to my room. I had intense times of prayer. I mean, I was dedicating my life to God. God, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll do anything. Just, just have them show me mercy this time, right? And here's the thing. Then I got to the point where I, I knew I was going to get it. So then I would go, okay. Okay, Father, okay. Let it be my dad, not my mom. Because my mom would light me up, right? My dad, three hits. I'd bury my, I'd bury my face in the pillow and go, oh, 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 and then I was okay. My mom, whoo. So then when I got in high school, I was so grateful that I was bigger. So my mom would get mad at me, and I remember we lived in a, I mean, we had a big house. It was a 35-foot travel trailer in a very, very scary trailer park in Decatur, right? And, uh, I mean, you know, there's nothing like being 15 when you move to this city and, and you got bikers wanting to beat you up when you're trying to walk to school at 15 years old. I had to deal with all that. And I, it's kind of amazing how God would deliver me, and I didn't even know what that was. But when my mom would get mad at me, I would just be like, oh, mom, I love you. Here, come on, I'll, I'll have you be my mom. I'm always looking for reasons to touch her, right? So my mom would be so mad, and she's like ready to light me up, and I would, I would go, oh, mom, I love you, and I would, I would put my arms here, and I would hug her, and she'd be like, let me go. I am so mad at you, and then I would start, oh, mom, I love you, and I'd kiss her, I'd just kiss her, you know? Thank you, sweetheart. I, and she just, like, for about 30 seconds, she's just let me go, I am so mad at you, and then she would melt, and she'd start laughing, I'm like, okay, dodge the bullet, so how did, why did I get into all that, I have no idea, I, I don't really like telling on myself, the chastisement, the discipline, this word means discipline, it means punishment, it means restraint, notice it doesn't mean correction, see, when my mom or my dad would spank me or ground me, it was to correct a behavior. It wasn't to punish me. To be honest with you, as a parent, you learn that it hurts you more than it, right? Now, Pastor Torian has quoted to his children, I know this from Pastor Teresa, that he would look at them and go, now this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. <laughs> but I think if you got these two all over to the side, and, and out of the two of them, I probably would not want to mess with <laughs> Pastor Elisa. She probably had my mom's anointing on that one. <laughs> but uh, but we, don't, we don't punish our children. We correct our children, right? Right? But this word means the chastisement, the punishment. Do you realize we had discipline and punishment coming? This word, I mean, it's an amazing word. It means the restraint. This chastisement was restraining something from coming to us, the peace of God. That word peace literally means has within it prosperity. The thing that was keeping prosperity from coming to us, the thing that was keeping this peace that passes all understanding, the restraint of that, look at this, I, I, it's just amazing. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, that's a little, that's a little interesting because in the, in the Hebrew language it's not plural, it literally means and with his bruise. We are healed, physically healed, with his bruise. It goes on to say that it was, it was, it was the Father's joy to bruise him for you and I. See, we're in covenant. Jesus shed all of his blood for us. I love this. And with his stripes or with his bruise, look at how it, it, it changes here. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our sin was upon him. And with his stripes or with his bruise, look at the change. We are healed. We are healed. Present tense. 
means that this is an all-inclusive blessing for all men and for all time. Do you need healing in your body today? We are healed, right? What is that word healed? Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that healeth you. I am your great physician. It means to heal completely. It means to mend, to cure. This describes the process of healing. It describes the process of being restored to health and to be made healthy. Why can you believe God for that? Because Jesus was bruised for you. Here's another one. Jesus became poor so that you and I, through his poverty, might become rich or be made rich. The word rich means a full and overflowing supply. So 2 Corinthians 8, 9 really shows us this. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, you know, Pastor Davis talked about this verse. It says here, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Now, if you watch The Chosen or some of these things, which have a lot of really cool stuff in it, but there's one thing that they're really wrong about. Because they'll talk about Jesus like he's some poverty-stricken guy. Which is hilarious because he kept the whole law. So according to the law, there is no way he was not wealthy. Okay? Though he was rich, it's the Greek word plusios, it literally means wealthy. It means abounding in material resources. Do you know Jesus had a treasurer that was stealing from him and he always had more than enough? They, one school did a study of the magnitude of his ministry and the money that it would have taken of the day and I can't remember the amount so I won't tell you but it was a massive ministry. I mean, if you look back at when Jesus was a baby, the Magi brought him gifts. And, you know, we, we have our little things for Christmas, you know, where the Magi come and they have a little box of gold, little cute little box, and it almost looks like, a, you know, something a makeup would be in. Frankincense, a little box of myrrh. But, but that's not how Magi would come when they would see, and, and they weren't coming to just see any king. The Bible says they were coming to see the king. They would have brought so much wealth that it would have fueled, you know, when Joseph, when they went to Egypt and when Jesus was in Egypt, they were well taken care of because he couldn't work, right? They had to continuously flee because they were looking to kill Jesus, but they had more than enough money. Jesus would have had more than enough money. People will be shocked, but it's a blindness, on people. Even, even his robe, when they took him into custody, it says, it just has this little, this little phrase, his robe was without seam. And, and we read over that, but you know, only kings and very wealthy people wore robes that were without seam. It would be like Jesus would be wearing a five to ten thousand dollar customized suit. But if you'll notice, did any of that produces identity no did any of that see he had stuff i mean it tilts people to think that he he had a house oh, i bet his house was really nice i bet he had the money once the, once those four guys tore up the house and let the guy down that was his house right he didn't seem upset about that right he wasn't upset about that he probably had plenty of money to, to fix it right Though it says here, now remember, we're not, we're not adding the scriptures here. Though he was rich, wealthy, abounding in material resources, yet for your sakes he became poor. I can't even pronounce this Greek word, so I'm not even going to try. But it means he became a beggar to be poor, to be helpless, and therefore to beg. What? On the cross... All of a sudden, Jesus is like, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? 
he, when, when the weight of all this was upon him, he's, I mean, and it talks about it in the book of Psalms, that his, the waves were billowing over me. It's, it's almost like Jesus was he, was, he was, he was made poor in every way. But what happened at the end of that? He said, it is finished. And when he said that, Everything that could come against you in this life is finished. And you know it. Satan knows it. All those demons coming against you know it. But I'm telling you, you, they have to know that you know it. And you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord so you submit to his word. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Because he knows he was stripped. Though... And, and you through his, or it's a, yet for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty, this gives us a picture of a beggar because of the helplessness of the individual. It's a person that's completely destitute of riches and abundance, so that you through his poverty might be rich. This word denotes to be or to become rich to have an abundance of outward possessions or to become wealthy, to have a full and overflowing supply. If that's not you today, get excited. And I don't care what you do for work. I don't care what your income is because your income is never to produce your lifestyle. Your income is to produce seed And the seed that you sow into the kingdom of God will produce your lifestyle. That's the way it's supposed to work. And I'm here to tell you guys, we don't know what economic thing's going to go on in the world before we leave, but we are never to lack. We're never to, we're we're just never to lack at all. Right? I think of, I think of people that, you know, my heart really goes out to single parents because they're trying to to take care of a family and work and do all this stuff. Man, don't, for you, don't get into toil. There's a place of no toil for you. And it's right here. And, it, and it's sealed in the blood. God said, I will be your provider. Right? Another one, Jesus died my death so that I could live his life. The great exchange. This is what we're going to be talking about. The great exchange. He died my death so that I could live his life. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Right? But then he goes, but wait a minute. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And now this life that I live in the flesh, how do I live it? By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, it says this. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Right? He that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. Wow. Jesus died on a cross so that I could live victoriously in my life. This is so powerful. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says this. It says, Nay, In all these things, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him that loved us. Wow. Jesus, here's another one. Jesus came to this earth through natural birth that we might enter into the kingdom of God through spiritual birth. That's why he came so that we could be taken out of the delegated uh, kingdom of darkness, the delegated influence of darkness, and put into the kingdom of his dear son. 
Hallelujah. Isn't that, isn't that important? You're free today. If your life doesn't look like freedom, then get excited because God has provided everything. He's not going to provide it. He's already given you everything. Now all you got to do is learn how to believe that and operate and pull it into this realm through faith. Jesus came to live in our home, the earth. This is another one. So that we could go live in his home in heaven. And I got to tell you, we're going to be in heaven. It's not going to be a long time. We're only going to be there for seven years. Then we're going to come back to the earth during the millennial reign of Christ, and we're going to be back down here for a thousand. Then we're all going to be taken off the earth and all the unrighteous dead will then be judged, and then they will experience a second death, the lake of fire, and then God's going to make a new heaven and new earth, and then guess what? Heaven's going to come tabernacle on the earth. The city of God, the very tabernacle of God, and God will dwell on the earth with us. That's interesting. Here's another one. Jesus clothed himself as a man so that you and I could be clothed by the Spirit of God. Wow. Man, I'm telling you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, it's such a humbling thing to me that the very Spirit of God that dwells in me, that is there to help me, that, that literally has taken up eternal residency in me, that I could receive him and receive another aspect of his ministry and that not only is he within me, but he comes upon me. He, he empowers me to walk through life, to be a blessing, to bear fruit, empowers me to do ministry. The greater one is not only within me, but he's upon me. And the reason why he could be upon me is because Jesus took upon himself flesh and came down here. Jesus, here's another one, Jesus endured rejection so that we might have acceptance as his children. Man, I don't know how you grew up. You know, I grew up, I never knew my biological father. My stepdad was a full-blown alcoholic just bound and, and, you know, uh, you know when, I talk to, when I talk about that, I'm so glad. I mean, he's in heaven today. Jeanette and I led him to Christ 11 days before he passed away at the VA hospital in Los Angeles. The last thing I said to him on the earth was, I love you. The last thing he said to me was, I love you. He went home from that after he was led to Christ, and he told, he told my mom, he's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. You know, he was, where, how did he get so abusive, so bound the way he grew up? He grew up very abused and very bound, right? I mean, I grew up in those years as a teenager and even younger just feeling like there was no place for me. I was so incredibly blown away when I realized the God of heaven my heavenly father has a place for me. He's accepted me. It's hilarious to me that I'm a pastor because I feel like a dad. Well, what did I know about being a dad? Because if you looked at the examples in my life, you know, thank God the biological father was not there. He was a mafia killer, right? I found out though, after he passed away, I think there was a call on his life. Because as a young man, he went to live with a priest because he considered being a Catholic priest. So I wouldn't doubt if there was a call on his life. I think that's hilarious. But you know who taught me to be a father? My father, my real father, God. For you single parents, guess what? God commits himself to say, I will be a father to the fatherless. Do you know those little boys that are growing up? If they're growing up in a single home, guess what? Do you know they're going to be incredible dads? Because they're going to be taught of God. 
The Bible says that. So Jesus, here's another one. Jesus bore our shame so that we could share his glory. Do you know God puts grace in you and what comes out of you when you walk in the grace of God, which is his blessing, the glory of God comes out of you. He bore our shame. Listen, if Satan ever comes to you about a mistake you've made or mistakes you've made or whatever, and he says, shame on you. This is what the Lord told me to tell him years ago. He said, Tony, when Satan says shame on you, you say no my shame was put on Jesus. And he put his love, his mercy, his grace, right? His righteousness in my life. So no shame on me. Do you know the shame of sin is what drags you back into the sin? If Satan could get you feeling really bad about what you did, guess what you'll do again? It'll drag you back because there's no freedom there. Jesus took care of the shame. He bore the shame. One more. Jesus was punished so that you and I can be forgiven. Forgiven. Wow. It's hard to even talk about that. Forgiven. Hallelujah. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Hallelujah. Can you guys take a little bit more? Yes, please. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love that group of people. <laughs> yes, I know. They're so much hungry. I, I know. I know you could. John, well, let's, let's look at this. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. I want you to see this. It says here, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness... And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay? So when you got born again, you were taken out once and for all from the delegated influence of darkness. You might feel that Satan is all over your life. But guess what? You're not under his delegated authority anymore. So if he's stealing from you, just tell him to stop. Right? You know, they say you can't really focus on the word and teach your services go what an hour and a half almost two hours no people can't handle that your church will never grow right ha 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 no 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 it it'll grow we'll let god build it right because what people need is the truth they don't need a good internet sermon right look at this literally Colossians 1.13 says this, who hath once and for all delivered us out of the authority of darkness and hath transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Hebrews 9 verse 12 says this. You can just look up on the screen, but it says this, neither by the blood of goats and calves. You could translate that by or through. Neither by or neither through the blood of goats and calves, but by or through his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He purchased our freedom. He took his very blood into heaven, into the tabernacle that he made with his words. And as our high priest, he went in and put his blood on the mercy seat forever sealing our freedom. John 8, 36, whoever the Son hath made free is indeed free, right? Jesus took his blood once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. I, you, who have literally bowed to the Lordship of Christ, have been redeemed by his blood. Redeemed means that a ransom is paid so that you would be freed from one place, the delegated influence of darkness, and put into another place, the kingdom of God's dear son. His blood produces a perfect righteousness. That perfect righteousness, it breaks all guilt, all shame, 
all condemnation off of your life. It breaks everything off your life that would mess with your life and would mess with your mind even. You got to understand, remission Remission is the New Testament word for forgiveness. It doesn't just mean your sins are blotted out and washed away. It means more. It means that everything that could mess, all the condemnation, all the guilt that could mess with your mind has been broken. And now you can meditate in the word of God, renew your mind with the word, and you could have a righteousness consciousness and get free from a sin consciousness. The power of sin is broken. Sin consciousness is broken. All guilt and all shame is broken. Isn't that amazing? You could be sitting here today feeling guilt and shame and you are free from it. So you could tell it to leave in Jesus' name, but you got to have revelation knowledge of this. You got to say, it is written. This is what he did for me, right? God looks at you as if sin never existed in your life. You know why? He doesn't see you in sin. You know why? Because it doesn't exist. It was not covered by the blood of Jesus. It was washed away. It's gone. When you stand before a holy God, you'll be able to stand in his presence with no sense of guilt, inferiority, or shame as if sin never existed because he took care of it. I have faith in the blood, right? I'll finish with this. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, if the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, that's talking about all that stuff that happened in the Old Testament, how much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience This means cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now we can tell if a person has a sin consciousness because they will live their life, they won't share their faith, they won't do works, right? Because your works flow. See, we don't work for our salvation, but because we're saved, works flow from salvation, In other words, I I have revelation knowledge of what God did for me. I've got to just give this away. Right? What is the outreach ministry of our church? Why don't you jump in? You are to be a one-man outreach ministry. Have you told anybody about Jesus lately? Are you discipling people? Are you willing to be a viable part of your church family and help out? It takes a lot of people so that we could have an environment where people could get equipped to go do ministry. Is he your whole life? If he's not, don't beat yourself up. Get to know him. Because when you taste, you will see that he's good. And when you taste him, you'll never want to taste that other nonsense of your life that you think might be good. Right? That's the good news. It is the goodness of God that leads a person to change. Do you know the bulk of the world thinks that Christianity is just a religion and that God, he's one of these guys that kind of messes with people. He'll create situations and allow things in their life and just to kind of test them and see, no, no, that's not who God is. That, that's not who he's portrayed in the word. But see, people don't know the word. They just listen to whatever they hear from a pulpit. Man, I'm here to tell you, God loves you all the way. He cut a blood covenant with you. Wow. The purging of your conscience is a New Testament blessing. This blood covenant, it not only forgives and wipes sin away, it removes the guilt. It removes the sin consciousness. I mean, guys, there is nothing like living without any inner turmoil in your heart. Wow. So the New Testament word for forgiveness, as we go into this, it's remission. We're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. And to give you an idea of how powerful this is, 
the Abrahamic covenant. So in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it covers the creation account, right? It, it covers the fall, the antediluvians, right? That just means before the flood, all the creatures and people before the flood. It, it includes Noah and all this stuff. It covers a 2,000 year period in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. The last 39 chapters of Genesis cover a 400 year period dealing with Abraham and three of his descendants. That's the whole book. And then you start going into the whole Old Testament and all this stuff. It's all about this Abrahamic covenant and all that it means for us. How that we now are the spiritual children of Abraham. So, I mean, this is a huge thing. God says over and over and over, I am your exceeding great reward. I am your inaccessible place of refuge. I am your source of supply. I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm, my mercy's greater than your disobedience. Forget about what you're doing and get your eyes on Jesus and let him live through you. That's what we talk about here when we talk about blood covenant, okay?